Hi, um, I'm Adrian Gilardi, and this is a pre-recorded presentation. It's called New Estimates of Non-Renewable Biomass in Sub-Saharan Africa for the period 2010-2050. Thank you very much for the, for the invitation. And I will show you a new development that we are um, conducting with, with Stockholm Environment Institute and, and the University of Mexico, where I'm a, an associate professor. And we are developing, maintaining, and using this model that we call Modeling Fieldwood Saving Scenarios, MOFAS, uh, to try to better understand what's the impact of wood extraction for energy in, in traditional settings. So, uh, first of all, well, the, a little bit about the island. I will explain what it's um, non-renewable biomass. Just a reminder, very short. A couple of slides about um, the model I just mentioned. Some preliminary results, almost final. We are we are finishing a project. I thought it will be finished for this Congress, but it, it didn't, of course. Um, some one slide about the um, validation efforts that I think is very important, and some, some idea, yeah, some slides about how you can be in touch with us or, or, or follow the, the development of what we're doing if you're still interested in this. So we're dealing with traditional wood fuels, um, means that the wood that is just is extracted from, from the landscape or, or gathered that wood from the margin of a river or just from a cropland, um, or the charcoal that is made in traditional ways. We're dealing with just with these two sources of wood, wood energy, and, and it's called traditional wood energy. In fact, the way charcoal it's being made now in traditional ways. It's exactly the same as has been used or has been made for the last 500 years. So we are dealing with, with that kind of, of wood energy, not to be confused with modern that needs more complex modeling that has transport or, and the end use facilities are, are much, much complex. So non-renewable biomass in this context means that when you burn wood, then you will release CO2 plus other stuff that are products of incomplete combustion, but the CO2 at least will be um, fixed back into long carbon chains into, into wood through photosynthesis. And this cycle is the one that might be translated into net carbon that goes into the atmosphere or net carbon that, that it's fixed back. And that might be used as a, as a coin of exchange in cooks of projects for financing these, these projects. If you can demonstrate that your project will fix more carbon than it releases by the business usual burning of, of woody biomass, then you might claim some carbon credits. And all of this, what we're doing, is basically linked to that, um, yeah, for, for that trade. However, um, landscapes are seldom <laughs> Uh, allocated only for fuel wood. There's a, a bunch of stuff going on. You have some land clearing for agriculture that that will ch change the spatial distribution of the sources, for example, and it will be a, some wood will be available instantly. Then you have charcoal can travel a lot of kilometers from one city to another, from one, one port to another. It's a, it's a very valuable commodity in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. And then you have other stuff like forest fires or or even other dynamics at the at the landscape. So what we are trying to do here is that incorporate some of these other dynamics not related to wood energy consumption to make the model a little bit more realistic. More, um, yeah, particularly we're dealing with land clearing for agriculture or for other uses. We are not considering forest fire yet, but the idea is that we, we will try to model this supply demand of carbon um, related to traditional wood energy into dynamic landscapes that account for land clearing for agriculture. So in, in quantitative terms, NRB, what we call non-renewable biomass, is a decrease of a background biomass within a time window. So that time window is important. If you choose a year, you might have like a clear plot might account for a lot of NRB, but then if you let time pass, then that vegetation will grow back. So the, defining the time window is essential. The other point to describe is the, the, the spatial realm. If you are looking at a continent, it was thing. If you're looking at a pixel, it's another thing. And the modeling that we're using, that we're using is pixel-based, so eventually we can aggregate this at whatever administrative unit we, we want. But the results will change depending if you focus in one particular area or you open that assuming the mostly local trade or not so local. When it's charcoal, it can travel, um, it can cross international borders as we model. 
So we are, this is a, like this, the second assessment that we do for for globally for NRB. The first one was in 2015, and this was um, pioneering in, in that time in the sense that we added a lot of geoprocessing operations that were not included before, but it's, it's still a snapshot in time. It's for 2009. Um, it has some complexities in the way fuel wood supply and demand are specialized and compared, but it's just one shot in time. It doesn't have any di dynamics and it doesn't have uh, other drivers of change that might affect supply and demand of, of wood energy that is not related, like, like for example, land clearing for agriculture. So uh, another important thing is that all the, 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 these values of how much and sustainable wood extraction for energy is and um, some cooks of projects sometimes claim very high values that are relatively easy to prove are not correct when you extrapolate this in time so having a, um, a model that evolves in time can show you that perhaps you have a value today but in the future you will have a different value it depends how things evolve so an, a low fnrb that you have now might be higher in 2050 for example and some of the stuff that that we are looking that's that's important to um, account for time in um in this presentation but what i was trying to say before is that very very high values of fnrb like 90 percent or or 99% or usually tend to drive forest to, to deforestation, um, tends to drive deforestation very fast. And yeah, that it's easily, you can, you can rule that out by looking um, at simple remote sensing two time period uh, analysis. So the idea also is just to bring these values to plausible, plausible ranges, no? Um, in the, the previous analysis, they were around 30%. In this one, uh, again, depends on the region. It might go lower and it might go higher in certain areas. Um, so how do we include these spatial dynamics in wood fuel supply demand analysis? It's not easy, but it requires a lot of modeling. And that is what we've been doing since a decade now. We produce this modeling that we call MOFAS, Modeling Fuel Wood Saves, Saving Scenarios. Um, you can Google this and, and, and be in touch. There's a lot of information on the web page. It's, it's in, uh, under construction right now, but but you will yeah you can you can be in the loop if you are interested in this kind of information. Everything that we are doing was already published in 2016 uh, in a model that uses different language, different set of tools, was less complex, but essentially has similar a similar motor, an algebra, an algebra motor, uh, uh, sorry, an algebra engine behind is pretty, pretty the same, pretty much the same. Now we're using instead of Dynamica, we're using mostly C++, for example, or a little bit of Python, a lot of R, um, and still using Dynamica for some geoprocessing operations. But these different languages and different approaches made it much more fast, and we tune a lot of stuff. But essentially, if you want to see how all of this works, is not so simple, but it's not com totally complex neither. So this is what we're using, and I'm not um, giving any extra detail here. This this slide will show you a little bit how this works, so you get a sense when we discuss results. So basically, it will assume for each um, demand center, each place that we assume there are people living and, and using fuel wood and charcoal, it will assume that people will go around, gather wood, and bring it back, or it, they will sell it very far away. But all that it's related, it, it's um, modeled in time, and then you will see an effect on the above ground biomass that it's always trying to grow back. So there's some growth function dynamics. In this case, it's a very extreme location it's for you to, to see how this works. It's, this is seldom the case in any place unless there is a lot of wood extraction and a little and little demand usually it's more balanced but you don't see much that's why i don't use that animation but that's the idea so once you have that this then you can aggregate it in time so this is i don't know a 20 year period or 30 year period then you can dissect this in different time periods or have a result for the entire simulation or you can aggregate this in different um administrative units for example let's see i can i can draw with this animation you can divide this and aggregate everything that is happening here in the in the uh, entire simulation and have one value 
So you can aggregate this because it's yearly and it's pixel based. That's important uh, information and information. It's already 10 minutes and five minutes away. So again, this is what just I just said. You can aggregate this modeling results that it's always pixel based by administrative region or you can go at the pixel level the point here is that there's trade involved here so if you go to one pixel that pixel harvesting might be um, influenced by faraway places if you have a big burning city not burning city uh, um, a big city that is burning charcoal far away it will influence influence farther so you can't go very local when you want to see how um, how values are. So for that, we have uh, one, yes, one of the future of the model that I will sh explain in a little bit how you should deal with that. So let me show a little bit of results. Oh, my face is, anyway, well. Um, so this is, we are running now Sub-Saharan Africa for four large regions. It takes quite a lot of, of computer um, processing and the results are, as, as I mentioned, you can have it for the entire region. So if we look at the entire region, we can see these two um, uh, graphs here, or, or yeah, or yeah, graphs here. Sorry. Um, so the first one, what you see here, is the above ground biomass for the entire area. And again, you will see um, a little. A, this is a little bit small, but um, light gray lines and a red line. The red line is the trajectory in the median, while the other ones is the uncertainty. So for some of the of the realization, this is with a Monte Carlo model, you have an increase in above ground biomass. For others, you have a slight decrease. So biomass within here in 2050, in, under this scenario, tends to lower a little bit, not too much. On the last one, let's go to, to, the, to the bottom one. You have the wood fuel use projected scenario that increases dramatically. So we are using some scenarios that I'm not an expert in that, but Rob Bayliss is here in, in, from, during the, the, the question and answer part. Uh, so the increase due mostly to urbanization that uh, has to do with charcoal and charcoal is uh, yeah, it's converted into wood. So the amount of wood that increases, the amount of demand that rises or increases in time, it's, it's quite big. So in the middle, what you have is NRB, how much wood is being extracted over the natural regrowth yearly, and FNRB, that is this percentage. In this case, it's quite a flat line. In the, in the second one, these are the box plots for the entire region and the entire uh, time period. So if you want to have a value for the entire period and the entire area, well, you can look at this. In this case, it's around 40%. Again, this is high mostly because of the last part of the simulation, 2030 onwards or 2040 onwards, because at that point, the consumption is so high. And again, um, the demand might not have, the supply have not might be much different from now, unless I'm land clearing. So this changed the results. Um, okay, again, you can you can summarize this at the administrative units. So you will have different FN, FNRB values with their uncertainty for each of the countries, or you can subdivide by administrative but sub-administrative units. All of that is is doable. Um, again, you as, as I explained before, you also will have raster based maps so results can be aggregated as by any user you can anyone can draw whatever area they want and they will have the value for that area and also um, the model produces this standard deviation at the raster level so you know how much certain or not different estimations are in different areas of the of the landscape another important thing well i'm one minute away um is that we are trying to validate this. There's a new mission that is called the Jedi Ecosystem LiDAR, Global Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation. We are already working with this data. We have a postdoc. So the idea is that there are places with clear gain in biomass and clear losses. We can't know the exact cost, but we are now trying to compare MOFUS results with, uh, with this Jedi mission at different uh, in different countries to try to validate if our estimates make some sense with ground truthing operations. Again, this is the team. It's it's a work for a lot of people before we started um, Rob and myself, but then a lot of people are now 
here most of them if not all are, are coders basically um, and and yeah we have a, a pretty good team now and um, again we usually used to do training courses but we're bringing those back because the idea is that people will be able to run this and have this their own information for their own area at their desired resolution without using this necessarily this um, values that we are calculating for the whole globe so thank you very much if, if you wanted to stay tuned just goggle mofus and i'm round of time oh i just passed for 25 seconds so thank you very much